Ready? Okay. Um, first off, I just want to make sure you're in the right place. Okay. And this room has a weird aspect ratio. So I have to figure out where to start on the left and where to end on the right. So it's just going to be like an international date line over here and a Greenwich Mean line over there. Okay, so how about, can you guys in the far right see this far if I write BCE 2200? Is that like visible to you? Is that cool? Do I have to move it to the left at all? Can I move it to the left at all? Okay, so I'll try to remember that this is where that is. Okay, so making sure you're in the right place. This is the course. This is my name. My email, this is my net ID. There's not too many ones left at Cornell. Okay. There's me, there's like Mike Thompson, who's the associate dean for undergraduate programs. There's I can't even think of any more right stuff. That's a good way to reach me. Um, office phone is not a good way to reach me, so I'm not even gonna tell you what that is. My office is 329 Lowe's. And you can feel free to stop by whenever the doors open. Okay. Um, Happy to see you if I have time. And if you want to see me, if you send me an email, I can generally get you in like within a half a day, like whatever. If you email me in the morning, I can get it come by this afternoon. But I'm not doing whatever. Um, I'm happy to meet you. I don't have any rigid fixed office hours because I find that when I do that, what happens is nobody comes and I sit around and wait and wait. No one comes except the week of the prelim that everyone comes and I stand up line on So I figure. Better to have a by appointment than, than to have a reading of these office hours. Okay, we have many TAs. A veritable army of TAs this semester. Um, now, one of the TAs is standing in the back of the room. Alex took the class in the fall of 2018. I've taught this course, by the way, this is time number four. I've taught this class the first time was like spring of 2015. And then fall 18, fall 19, and now now. And so I sort of understand the course now, kind of. So we figured it would be a good time to take a video. So we're taking videos of, this, of the lectures. We're not going to promise that they're going to be uploaded promptly to some accessible place. So don't rely on the videos. Uh, don't like say, oh, well, they're going to be videos, so I'm not even going to come to class. I really appreciate it if you would come. You know, it hurts my feelings when the room is empty. Anyway. Uh, but Alex is going to be uh, videotaping the lectures, and he's one of our TAs. He's, he's also going to be doing other TA stuff. And some of the other TAs, uh, one of them is a classmate of yours. How many, let me do some demographic, uh, get some demographic info here. How many um, sophomores in the room? How many non-sophomores in the room? Yeah. <laughs> Come on, George, you have to raise your hand. Okay. He's a grad student, PhD student. Um, okay, how many uh, folks already not affiliated with ECE and don't plan to affiliate with ECE? So where are you guys from? Are you from like C? Yeah, yeah I know you're a grad student. You told me a minute ago. How about Maggie? Sorry, Maggie. Maggie, okay. AEP. AEP. Maggie. Maggie. CS. CS. Government. Government. <laughs> <laughs> That's a new one. Okay, well, the AEP person clearly, they're, they're the competition, right? Because the AEP are like the Marines in this college venture. They're a few crowds. <laughs> CS person, you know, he's competition too. I think of AEP as like the hardest engineering major, and EC and CS are the second hardest kind of tied in terms of like, like, intellectual depth. In terms of like pure grunt workload and rigidity, Mackie wins, well, sort of tied with Kemi. I don't know. But anyway, okay, well that's good. Um, by the way, I've been here for a long time. I've been at this for quite a while. This is, as of this week, 38 years on the EC faculty at Cornell, so that's a pretty, pretty long time. I'm also the undergraduate advising coordinator for EC. I'm happy to answer your questions about the major. You know, anything, you know, you want to hear about requirements or how they're going to be changing or, you know, advisor assignments. You, those of you who have affiliated, you've gotten an email from me offering you a chance to give input on who your advisor is and so on, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm available for that as well. You don't have to just ask about stuff, of course. Anyway, we have many TAs. Um, we have, to, uh, let's see, three undergraduate TAs. 
one of whom was a TA last semester, then there's Alex, and then there's uh, Luke James, who took the course last fall. So he might be a classmate of yours. You know, I don't know if you know him, but he's, he's going to be TA in the class. And then we have two MN students, uh, Christina Nemeth and Pooja Manan. I hope I'm pronouncing her name right. Then we have one PhD student. And so we have a, a bunch of TAs. And the reason we have a lot of TAs is because there's a lot of you. Okay, but I want you to remember that it's not, don't just go to the TAs. If you have questions, feel free to email me, ask me questions, whatever. I'm, think of me as equal to a TA in that regard. Okay. We have labs. Okay, now what are these labs? These labs are pretty much software labs using MATLAB. And so it's not going to happen every week. The first couple weeks, we're not going to have any labs. The times of the labs, you already know. You're already signed up for a lab section probably. You have Monday and Wednesday afternoons, Monday and Wednesday evenings. TAs will, will run the labs. They all meet in the same room. And they're the kind of lab where generally you could do everything ahead of time and just come in and show them and get checked off if you want. Or if you don't want to do it that way, you can show up and do it all there. That's fine. You know, but but you'll, you'll get the rhythm of the labs. Homework assignments, roughly every week you'll have a homework assignment. And what about the homework assignments? I think of the homework and the labs as well as primarily learning tools rather than assessment tools in the sense that I don't want to count the homeworks and the labs for a, bit, a large percentage of your grade because I want you to work together on them. I want you to feel free to talk to each other. Don't hand in totally identical things on the homework because those who will grade the problems and, and the, the problems will be graded, not all of them, a subset of the problems on each assignment will be graded, maybe two or three problems per assignment by the TAs. And you won't know ahead of time which ones those are. So keep you honest. But <clears throat> anyway, I want you guys to talk to each other and feel free to collaborate. And, and I don't want it to count for too much because you know people naturally self-select into groups. And sometimes there's this like group of hot shots that works together. And then there's a group of people who are struggling a little bit to work together. And I don't want that to, them to be costing each other. You know, you know what I mean. So, so anyway, homework doesn't count for a lot. It's going to count for like 15, 12% of your grade. The lab will count for like you know, 5 to 10% of your grade, and the rest of the grade is going to be on the, the prelims of the final. There's going to be two prelims and a final. Okay, and we have evening prelims because, as you can see, this class is too big to have a prelim in this room. Evening prelims are on the schedule. Uh, website, Canvas, you know, etc. cetera, all, all the usual stuff. So, anyway. What about any other administrative stuff? Let me think. And do you have any questions about this kind of administrative stuff? At the top here. Yeah. Is the canvas up right now? I think I think there's there's nothing on it, but it's up in the sense that there is a, a course site, and I think you've all been added automatically in the background to this course site if you're if you're registered for the class. Cornell is really sort of micromanagey about their canvas. You know, they do every. I, it's hard for me to manually add people. I finally figured out how to do it. I can't manually subtract people and have them stay off. You know that kind of thing. But anyway. And oh, by the way, you know you, you might notice that we're using a rather low tech way of, of recording the lectures. And you, in other words, well, Alex is a high tech person, but we have just a, a traditional like video camera, and we're gonna have a. Uh, microphone, the wireless mic. We don't have it today. It's, it's supposed to arrive today. So why are we doing this? Well, um, not only we used to Cornell. Have you heard of Video Note, folks? Have you heard of that? You not too many have anymore. Um, it's a private company founded by a couple of Cornell grads, Ryan Morris, and I think he was a CS major, and Paul George was an EC major, and Paul stayed for his PhD as well. But anyway, he you know he took a couple courses from me when he was here. Anyway, they founded this company where they would have someone come in and videotape lectures, and then they would get a content expert to watch the lectures and annotate them. Like say, this is where the professor talks about discrete time Fourier transforms for the first time. This is where the professor talks about game theory, you know, whatever. And then they would put those videos up on, on, on their, their own site. And in the future offerings of the course, the professor could either opt to have the course taped again or just have the old videos available to the students. And they charge an exorbitant fee to Cornell to have 
the old videos available to students, the hosting fee was, was high, like 7,500 bucks a semester or something like that. So the powers that be in Day Hall decided this, isn't, this just isn't worth it. We're spending like 100K a year on this private company, VideoNote, and only ECE and CS and a couple other engineering majors use it at all. You know, like Mac 2940 used it for a while. So, and we have all this wonderful lecture capture tech at Cornell. Then we can easily cover what they did. So they, they canceled VideoNote. And it turns out that there's no lecture capture technology at Cornell capable of capturing a lecture where the professor moves. <laughs> okay? So if you want to, you, you have to stand here, okay? And you have to have uh, slides or whatever. And you have to point and not, well, you can, you can move like five feet, I've heard, you know, like one way or the other. So, so the, quote, smart classrooms over in Upson with the whiteboards and the hotshot stuff, you know, it doesn't work for a traditional blackboard lecture. And you may say, well, why is anybody giving traditional blackboard lectures anymore? Well, it, have you ever taken a math course with slides? No, <laughs> not good. PowerPoint does not work for this kind of stuff, in my opinion. You know, so, so I, I mean, I don't consider giving blackboard lectures a retrograde kind of old school, you know, thing that's obsolete in, in a course of this kind. And if you do, then let me know. I mean, I'm interested to hear your view on that. But, but anyway, about the lectures, uh, because it's a 75 minute class, we will generally have like a three minute break in the middle at some point. And I kind of have to get used to it because I haven't taught an 1140 class for like five years. So I'll forget like what is the middle of the class, but I'll, I'll learn after a while. You know, my learning curve is pretty good for that. I will have a little break. And part of that is because like I've, I've been known to write fast sometimes or talk fast sometimes and people say, oh, you write so much on the board, you know, I can't get it down. Well, remember we have these videos, so, you know, you're welcome to take pictures of the board too, if you want, something like that. Um, and also, you know, like it, it, it slows me down a little bit, it enables me to relax, it enables you to relax and so on. And you can ask questions, whatever. So we're gonna have a break. We're probably not gonna have it today because today is kind of like this mushy, you know, not really part of the course lecture for part of it. Um, and I want to learn your names. I want to try to learn your names. I already know a couple of them, mostly because they're grad students. Uh, let's see, who else do I know? You, I know. Um, oh, well. So I'm going to try to learn your names. <laughs> And, and, there, and there has to be a, a person to ask the first question. Okay, you ask the first question. What's your name? I'm Bryce. Bryce? Okay, I've learned a name. There we go. All right. All right, so any questions about this administrative stuff? Yeah. Actually, if you're going to upload the, the videos, where can we get it? I'm going to figure that out. Um, like, I have a personal YouTube channel where I have videos of other courses like 3250 and 4271, two other courses that I've taught from time to time at Cornell. And if worse comes to worse, I will upload them there. And if there's a way to host them on Canvas, maybe we can do that. It's kind of, it, it takes like 40 minutes to upload a lecture video or half an hour to upload a lecture video to YouTube. I, I learned that when I was uploading the videos for the other courses, so. So, anyway, I don't know the answer. What's your name? Don Yu. Don Yu? Yeah. Like D O D A N Y U. Excellent. Okay. Any other questions about the admin type stuff? Yeah. So I just checked Canvas five minutes ago and it's not showing up for students. Um, do you have an idea of a time frame? Like I'll find out. I'll figure it out. Okay. What's your name? I'm Esther. Esther. I'm, I'm, you're, I'm really lucky that you guys are sitting in a contiguous uh, graph, graph here. You know, K3. <laughs> I don't know, graph theory. Anybody take CS2800? Yeah, I <laughs> think you know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> okay. All right, any other questions? Okay. All right, so we might as well just start talking about stuff. <coughs> I'll put this I feel like I'm missing, I'm missing one thing or two things. And by the way, as we have the left and the right, the international date line, and 
Greenwich Meridian or whatever you call it, we need a Tropic of Capricorn. Okay, so how how low can I go? Tell me, folks in the back. That's too low. Too low. How about Canvas? Is that good? No. Do I really have to go with this? How about how about let's how about here? Is this good? Okay, so when I come into the room every day, I will try to remember to do this. <laughs> this. So we can keep our keep our, our reality focused in a small area. Yeah. Where should we turn the homework in? Oh yeah, but where you know stuff like that. Where do we turn the homework in? Usually that doesn't come up until like like week two when you have a homework due. Out there is this black thing that has slots in it. We're gonna have a slot for EC twenty two hundred. If you do. If you, if you make a hard copy of your homework, which might be the easiest way to do it, you can stick it in there. Uh, you can also email it to me as an attachment, and I can forward it to whoever's grading the problems. Or uh, there's ways to upload assignments to Canvas that, that students discovered last semester I wasn't even aware of until uh, the first few students said, my homework hasn't been graded, why not? I said, well, did you hand it in? Yes, I uploaded it to Canvas. Oh, I don't think the kids even know about that. So, so there is a way to do that, and you, you can do that as well. If you're if you're a type type person or whatever, but hard copy, old fashioned hard copy, there will be a slot available out there. And the deadlines on the homework are going to be firm. Um, let's just leave it at that for now. Any other questions? Yeah. What day of the week are they likely to be on? What day of the week are they likely to be on? It, it's going to be different from week to week, partly because prelims. You know, like I don't want to have. If, if the homework is due like Thursday and I have a, and there's a prelim that night, I don't want it to be that day, you know, that kind of thing. So I think last semester, well, you know, the spring is different from the fall because the rhythm of the breaks is all different. So I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. Can you think of anything else? Oh, yeah, that's right. That's what it was. I even got the book out. <laughs> Here's the book. Yay. Okay. This is called DSP First. It's available at the campus store, and also you can find it online, but I can't tell you where because that would be cheating. Hint, hint. Okay. It's by uh, McClellan. McClellan is a professor at Georgia Tech, and he was a longtime collaborator with one of our faculty members, Tom Parks, who's now retired. There's a famous DSP algorithm called the Parks-McClellan algorithm. And the second author, Schaefer, uh, he's the co-author with Oppenheim of a famous book on DSP that in almost every like digital signals processing course at the upper level uses. And Yoder is just some dude. Uh, I think he's like their former grad student or person who actually did the grunt work on the lab or whatever, you know, but he's not, he's not like a Hall of Fame signal processing guy like the other two are. And there's some good things about this book and there's some annoying things. I'm not, I'm not fond of the notation, but we're going to be going to cleave to it slavishly. And there are some things that I will do a little differently from how they're done in the book and some things I'll do a lot differently from how they're done in the book. And I will try to alert you to that every time so that you don't get, you don't read the book and say, well, wait, there's nothing here. There's no such thing as a principal continuous time alias. I looked it up in the index and, well, that's my thing. You know, it's not the book. So anyway, you'll, you'll, you'll see those, those things will pop up once in a while. But yeah, yeah, you're supposed to buy this, this book, or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and some of, the, some of the homework problems will be from the book. So it's, to have the book. Although, like <coughs> last semester and the year before, I actually scanned in the relevant pages from the book that had the problems on them. So it, I wasn't using the fact that we had homework problems from the book to force you to buy the book. Just keep that in mind. And what was innovative about this book, by the way, is that when it came out, which was about 20 years ago, and this is the second edition, 
it came out, and there was an intermediate sort of form of this book that had a slightly different title. It was called Signal Processing First, where they did more continuous time stuff. <coughs> but then they reverted to the DSP First original title. It came out because around the country there weren't a lot of courses at the 2000 level or 1000 level that dealt with signally kind of stuff. And these folks thought it would be good to have that. You know, you have your, your entry level circuits course in EC 2100. You have your entry level digital course 2300. Why not have an entry level signals course? And back in the day, people would say, oh, well, signals math is just too hard for sophomores. They just can't deal, you know, or whatever. But that's not really true. So these guys came up with this idea that this should be the first thing that everyone sees rather than the last thing. And for most of you, it's probably the last thing of the, of the three entry level courses. Most people, they take digital logic first, they take circuits, and then they take this. And some were like that. Um, but at Georgia Tech, you declare a major incoming, as an incoming freshman. So, you know, you're already an ECE when you come in. And, and you're, their, their program allows ECE to require courses of freshmen. We can't do that here at Cornell, because we're in the Ivy League. And we want you guys to have two years of, of major free existence, you know, where you can take anything you want, basically. Well, not quite anything you want, but we're, we're not allowed to require anything of freshmen. So we didn't have that option. So this, this originated as kind of an advanced freshman level book. You know, as long as people that had calculus, you know, they could take the, they could use this book. So it was sort of second semester freshman year kind of book. And we adopted it for the for EC twenty two hundred back in the day, and it's persisted. So so yeah, EC is maybe the broadest major in the college of engineering in terms of stuff it covers. And you can think of this, uh, like I said, as the entry level signals course. Like, if you, a uh, uh, kind of a crude characterization of engineering is this kind of mixture of, of math, science, and artifice. Okay, wizardry. Like, Al Molnar is a wizard. You know, I don't know if you ever had a course from him, but you know, he's an example of a wizard. You had a course from him? Yep, yeah. analog last semester and this year, this semester advanced analog. Right, so he's like the Gandalf of circuits, right? Anyway. <laughs> um, but, okay, so math, science, and in ECE, you can think of, of the circuits, devices, opto, part of the department is the more physics-y kind of thing, the more science-y kind of thing. You can think of the, uh, the digital stuff, the computer engineering courses, Compark, you know, the Battens and Albanese's of the world. And it's uh, and Zero Zang, those guys. That's more of the kind of like interface with CS. And then this part of the department, the part, and, and 2300 is the intro to that. This part of the department, the signals part, is the more applied math part of EC. And so we will be, you know, unabashedly talking about applied math in this class, really. You know, you're going to be learning some math constructs. And the kinds of things we're going to be talking about turn out to be applicable not only in the world of EC signals and whatever, but also. If you ever want to study, say, machine learning or data science or, or anything like that, the kind of math you use in signals is the kind of math you use in those fields, or at least part of the kind of math you use. So, so those hot areas, you know, this is more of a prep for them than any of the other 2,000 courses in ECE, I would say, if you need additional sales pitch for why EC2200 is worth it. But anyway, um, okay, so so, anything else about the general stuff before we kind of like just start kind of easing into the material? Okay, well, anyway, uh, so it's a course, the title of the course is Signals and Information, you know. So, Signals. And I'm out of practice writing on the board, it's been like a month and a half, so I'll be rocky at first. So if you have a course called Signals and Information, then probably the first thing you should do is define what a signal is and define what information is. You know, and it's kind of hard to do that. It's kind of hard to do that because because personally, I even though like over the course of the semester we'll be considering a far more restricted version of you know signals and, and whatever. I like to think of si uh, the word signal as a very general thing. Like so, what is a signal? So what is a signal? 
roughly is some entity that, and maybe I'll, I'll put these words in quotes, entity that quote unquote carries quote unquote information. So already in defining a signal, we've already used the I word. Okay. So we've got to be careful about that. Entity, what's it going to be? We'll see. Carries, what that mean? We'll see. So what about information? What is that? Well, I, I like to think of it as a very general kind of thing. It could be, you know, it could be actual information, like with instructions, you know, how to set up the webcam or whatever, that kind of thing. Or it could be music. I like to think of music as being information. We're going to have a lot of examples for music. And in fact, there's going to be, a, we're resurrecting the semester a, a kind of a semester long project y kind of thing where you get pieces of it as you go along. I tried to do it last semester, but it all came crashing down. Um, but it's, have, how many of you have heard of Shazam? Yeah, okay, so it's a way, you have a clip of a song, and you hold it up to Shazam, or I guess you hold your, Shazam is in your phone, right? Is this how it works? You hold your phone up to the clip of the, the music, and it tells you what song this is a clip of. Now that's, that's a hard problem to solve, but right? when you think about it, how does that work? Like, you know, it can't have a library of every song in the universe and sort of tediously compare, you know, bit by bit or whatever, what's coming out of your phone or what's, what's coming out of the speaker with that library. And also, the what's coming out of the speaker might be low volume, but might be high volume, so it's not going to match up. The volumes aren't going to match up. Uh, you know, it might be in another key even. I, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's, it's a really hard problem to figure out how to solve that fast. So you need some kind of library of signatures of songs, like a really short way of describing key features. It's like a feature vector. There we go, machine learning talk. A feature vector for every song. And what you do is you get the stuff coming out of the, the, the speaker, and you process it through Shazam, and it comes up with a piece of a feature vector, and then it compares that piece of feature vectors to feature vectors of all the songs, and it finds the one where that is a subvector of it. Essentially, that's how it works. We're going to be kind of doing our own version of that. All right, so it's going to be kind of interesting. I, I don't know how it's going to work. Um, this is, we, I inherited that from Professor Tong, who also <coughs> teaches this class. He made it up with, with the help of his TAs a couple years ago. But anyway, that was a digression that stemmed off of my comment that I like to think of music as being information. Uh, and music is allowed as information. So that might sound weird. Like you don't, you don't generally talk about music like you talk about information. Like you don't say, you know, <clears throat> you know. I really don't like the new Radiohead album. You know, it's not nearly as informative as the last one. You know, I mean, I've never heard anyone critique a music thing that way. But we do think of music as information in this class. So anyway, entity that carries information. So a lot of the signals in this class. So many sort of slash most slash almost all signals in this class and I'm trying to think I'm in, in, in this room sometimes I'll divide these boards and so we'll see how, how that works they're going to be functions of time okay so what is a function of time? Two words, function, time. So let's look at time. Time in this class could be either continuous or discrete. And continuous is a real value or discrete. And in this class, it's going to be integer value. And a typical time variable for continuous time is going to be t, obviously. So t for, for time, this is the typical notation for continuous time variable. 
and particular values of this are going to be subscripted t's, like t1, t2, t0, whatever. And n is going to be the typical notation for discrete time variable. And typical values of this are going to be subscripted n's. And there are some problems, you know, like t, when is t part of a word? Where versus t time? Well, I'm going to try all semester when I have t as part of t is part of a word, I'm just going to write the t this way. Just a straight line and a cross hatch where t being time, it's going to have a little hook at the bottom. So that's going to be my effort as we go along. Okay, so this, those are typical notations for time variables. Functions of time, a function has to have both a domain and a range, a set of values in which it takes. So functions Not, not just have a domain, but also range. Okay, so what kinds of functions are we talking about in this class? Well, we could have real value functions. So here's some examples. Say real value functions. of continuous time. Typical notation of those is going to be x of t, or y of t, or something, etc. Those kinds of things are what we're going to be using for these functions. And examples, how about x of t equals 3 cosine of 2 pi times 17 plus pi over 13, something like that. That's an example of such a thing. We'll also have, say, complex value functions. Of continuous time. For example, x of t equals, say, 7 cosine, or well, cosine well, is e to the 7 e to the j 2 pi times, say, 13 t, something like that. Okay. Now, you may say, wait, uh, I'm not familiar. We're, we're going to review complex numbers, complex number algebra. Don't worry about that. <coughs> talk about some things. And here, J denotes what a mathematician would call I, namely the square root of minus 1. Okay. And ECEs use that because they like to use I for current, typically. You could also have a real valued functions of discrete time. Real value, discrete time. How about, say, x of n, and here's a piece of notation that we're going to be using, that the book uses that I don't particularly like, but we're, as I said, going to cleave to it slavishly. Brackets for discrete time variable, parentheses for continuous time variable. So x of n equals 3 cosine of n times omega 0 hat plus pi over 5, say, where omega 0 hat is some real number. You know, we're going to see stuff like that. Real value function of discrete time variable n. And we're also going to have complex value functions of discrete time, etc. You know, I could go on and on, giving you all kinds of examples. But we could also have more esoteric things. Like, for example, how about a, how about um, a PCM signal? That would be something that takes on the values, say, 0, 1, and minus 1, depending on your PCM scheme. PCM stands for pulse-cold modulation. 
Okay, so this is going to be a 0 and plus and minus 1 value PCM signal. And here you're going to have continuous time. We're not going to spend time on these signals, but this is what the continuous time signal would look like versus T. It's going to be something like this. Good thing about real value signals is you can graph them, but it's going to have, you know, oops. <clears throat> Sometimes the chalk is low quality. But here's an example of, of such a signal. Say something like this. OK, so this is going to be 1 minus 1 and 0. So we can call this the x of t. This is a signal that encodes a bit string. What bit string does this signal encode? Well, here's how it works. When it's 0, that encodes a 0. When it's plus or minus 1, it encodes 1. Why do I alternate between the plus and minus 1s? Anyone have an idea of why you might want to do that? Yeah? If you had like two ones in a row, then it would be something different than just stopping for one. Like if you have like like plus one, plus one. Well, I mean, I have two zeros in a row here, right? And that doesn't confuse me. Yeah? Okay, so we're doing sines and cosines and representing it. Okay, this proposal was something to do with sines and cosines and representing it that way. I would say no, because this is not going to be periodic in general. And periodic signals, that's the universe where sines and cosines matter. Anything else? Any other ideas? Maybe you could have some type of tri-state system, depending on what side the voltage is being triggered on. Yeah, there might be a hardware reason. He, he proposes that, you know, you might have, uh, like, <coughs> Something where, you know, like a Schmidt trigger y kind of thing. You know, I don't know how many people, if you see that anymore in circuit classes, but it's a bi stable circuit that kind of has hysteresis, whatever. I don't know if that's what you're talking about, but yeah. Could it represent a break in the sequence? So you could have, when we speak to people, in sequences, we have spaces to separate words? No, this is just going to be bit string. This is going to represent a bit string of zeros and ones. And the way I describe it as follows. When it's 0, that encodes a 0. When it's 1, that encodes a 1. So this, this encodes this bit string. 1, 0, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1. OK. All right, I'll tell you the answer, why, why they alternate to plus and minus ones. You want to have signals that have kind of a 0 DC value. You don't want to have like a bias value in your signal. So if you have like a lot of ones, and say you encoded 0 is 0 and 1 is 1. If you had a lot of ones, more ones than zeros on the average in your signal, that would mean that your signal would have a positive DC offset. And so what you want to do here, the reason people do it this way a lot of the time is they want something that has essentially zero mean value. But anyway, this is just an example of another value set. In this case, three things, 0, 1, minus 1, instead of all the real numbers or all the complex numbers. And those kind of signals come up a lot in applications, like in the landline phone system. The signals that are flowing over the wires, well, I don't want to get into that now, but they, they look kind of like that. I'll just mention that these come up. Board, I'm going to split all the boards and see how that works. I don't know, how many people know about LaTeX or LaTeX or whatever you say it? Yeah, most of you, a lot of you. The guy who invented that, uh, Leslie Lamport, is a really smart computer scientist, and 
and he did a lot of research about what the optimal text width is, okay? And it turns out that people have a really hard time reading text that's more than 70 characters across. And so you want your width of your text to be less than or equal to 70 characters, and if you make it a lot less than that, then it gets to be longer and longer. So, so the standard LaTeX page is like 70 characters across. And I think the same thing happens, like if you ever tried to read a website where they have like a public domain article that takes up the whole screen, each line takes up the whole screen, that's really hard to read. You, you get lost, I get lost. I should impute my reading deficiencies on you. <laughs> but anyway, so that's why splitting the board sometimes makes the lecture more legible. Anyway. All right, so these come up in the landline phone system. And so those are examples of, of signals, continuous time to discrete value, and of course you can have discrete time to discrete value. And when I say discrete value, I mean like zero, one, and minus one. But wait, there could be more interesting examples of discrete value sets, right? Like what about, say, the set of all emojis? What about an emoji value discrete time signal? Or even more perversely, an emoji value continuous time signal. It's a smiley face for a while, and then it suddenly changes to an I hate you, and then suddenly changes to a bashful embarrassment thing, or whatever. But anyway, you could also have more esoteric value sets for signals. For example, sets of emojis. And you could have continuous or discrete time signals that have take values in a set of all emojis. But anyway, the, the, this is just the most abstract notion of what a signal, a, a signal that is a function of time. Now, not all signals are functions of time. Okay, I want to caution you. Remember, remember, I said many, most, almost all the signals, EC2200, functions of time. But there are other signals that are functions, but they're not necessarily functions of time. And for those cases, it turns out there's lots of ways of representing them as functions. So let me just uh, give you an example of that. Okay. So caution in, in life, and when I say life, I'm always referring to in the world of ECE and CS and whatever, in single <laughs> universe, in life, not every thing you want to call a signal is a function of, specifically of time, specifically. It's usually a function of something, but not necessarily of time. And it's going to take values in some set. So where does this come up especially? It comes up in things like images. And it comes up in things like, like data, like big data. If you have a big, huge data file, then essentially what you've got is you've got a function whose domain is the set of positions in the data file and whose range is bytes or bits or whatever, however you tend to parse the data. And if you have an image, so, so here's some examples. So examples arise in image slash data processing. So just how about, let's, let's look at a really specific example of this. Say you have a four megapixel grayscale image. So say you have or megapixel grayscale image. And uh, you know, there's some controversy about how it's spelled gray. Some people use A, some people use E. I'm using E. You don't have to use E if you don't like to. Okay. I'm never gonna strain you. And oh I forgot what the divide for it. So grayscale image. Okay. And what is a grayscale image? Well, it's a, it's a black and white image where each pixel is 
some shade of gray. Okay, ranging from black to white. Now, suppose there are, say, 256 different shades of gray. What is 256 in terms of powers of 2? Yes. That wasn't quick enough. <laughs> All right, so, so 256 gray <laughs> shades of gray. So what you're going to do is you encode each pixel as an 8-bit string. So it's a string of bits that's 8 long. And the 8-bit string encodes whatever shade of gray that pixel is. And since it's a 4 megapixel image, you have, and say it's a square, so say the image is square. So what do we have here? We have essentially a discrete time thing, a discrete time thing, where time is the position in the image instead of actual time. And the value for each position in the image is an 8-bit string. So we encode the whole image as a function, say x of, and I'm going to use k and l instead of m and n because I want to use n for time in a minute. So a function x of kl, and I'm putting brackets around this because the, the domain variable is discrete where for each K and L pair. And if you're a Python kind of person, then K are going to run from 0 to 2,000, not inclusive. If you're a MATLAB type person, then K is going to run from 0 to 2,000, inclusive. Okay. How many Python type people? How many MATLAB type people? Oh, good. We have, we're now controversy. Controversy. Anyway, so for each KL pair, and why do they run up to 2,000? Because I have a 4 megapixel image, and 2,000 squared is 4 million. X of A comma L is an 8-bit string. So here, the time-ish kind of thing is a pair of integers marking the position in the image. And the range-ish kind of thing is the set of all 8-bit strings. Okay. What about a video? How about a video? Well, a video is going to be a, a string of these, a stream of these. It's going to be a sequence of these. Okay, now, before I went into this example, I said there's going to be lots of ways of describing these things as, as functions. And they're not uniquely describable as functions. There's plenty of ways of doing that. So give me two ways of describing a video. So suppose the video is, say, video is, is how about uh, say 2 million images long. No, let's not use 2. Let's say 3 million images long. Here are different ways of sort of functionifying it, describing it as a function. Grayscale images, <coughs> four megapixels each, where the grayscales are encoded by 8-bit strings as a function. Okay. 
do x of kl n, where kl is the same and n is like the timestamp. Yeah. In case we use the image in the sequence and the number. That is one way to do it. So what's your name? Nick. Nick. Okay. So now I. This is the, my max names per cl per class day. <laughs> for after that, did you know that that seven is is a magic number in terms of of how you know how many things you can know you can remember? Like that's why phone numbers are like seven long. Well, you guys all dial area codes with every number, but when I grew up, you could just dial like you know two seven two six four two three without the six zero seven, and you get my house. <laughs> did you know that seven? Did you know that seven is, is is the holy length of things? Like, if I give you a list of seven numbers and I rattle them off, you can rattle them back to me, right? But if I give you a list of eight numbers, it's harder. It gets ex you know harder, like a step function almost. An example, and and so the way the human mind deals with that is we chunk things together. Okay, like if I said to you, here's a sentence. And I want you to recite the letters in all the words in this sentence backwards to me after I tell you a sentence. The sentence is, I love signals. OK. You could do that, right? You would say, OK, I'm supposed to recite all the letters backwards. So it goes S, L, A, N, G, I, S, C. I'm doing it. Signals, if that's the But if I said to you, OK, here's a list of letters. I want you to recite it backwards to me. I L O V E S I G N A L S. No way you could do that, right? Okay, so this is the human mind chunking things into sevens or less. Now, how do we get off on that tangent? Well, this, that's a definite first day of school type of thing to be talking about. <laughs> because Nick proposed having this video modelable as a function of three integer variables, <coughs> x of k, l, n, and some people would say m, k, l, but we'll use k, l, n because that's what you proposed, that runs 0 less than equal to k, comma, l less than 2,000, and 0 less than equal to n less than, oh, I'm betraying my pipe on this, oh, terrible, 3 times 10 to the 6th that takes values in the set of all eight bit strings. OK. Everybody see that that's a way of describing this function? This as a function. What's another way? Anybody have another another idea with a different value space? Yeah? I was thinking of that like a helper function that's sort of parametric, where the parameter for that function defines the frame of the so like maybe some h sub n of k and l. I'm not sure I understand that, but a helper function. I don't. I. I. I'm not good enough to understand it right off the bat, but so like in calculus when you parameterize the line, uh -huh. you don't necessarily have to incorporate another variable into the function that's already defined. You can just take the function that's already defined that defines that image, and then you have another function that takes that as an argument. Takes that as an argument or is it a, see I'm thinking maybe I maybe this is what you're saying, but I'm not sure. Like my second my first example was the same as his. Actually, that's my second example. But my, my second example, which is my first example in the head, is the following. Okay. It's a function. I'm going to call it y of n, where n runs from 0 to 3 million. That takes values in the set of all. Four megapixel images, grayscale, eight bit encoding. So the value space for this function 
is the set of all images of that kind. And it's only a function of time, or the, the number and the sequence of the images. Okay. Is that kind of what you were thinking? That's, that's exactly what <laughs> OK, OK, cool. And I forgot to split the board. Oh, well, maybe I'll just end the chip on that. We'll see how it works. All right, so, so anyway, there, the bottom line is signals are kind of information-bearing entities. What is information? Information is loose. Signals can be continuous time, discrete time. They can be continuous value, discrete value. If they're continuous or discrete value, they are continuous value, they can be a real value or a complex value. There's all kinds of options here. Okay. All kinds of options. Music, we want to think of music as signals, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what about some other general stuff? Color images, like what would a color image, how would you encode that? <coughs> Anybody know how that works? Yeah. <clears throat> Which color is a component from three base colors? Yeah. You just pronounce it each other. Right. Basically, what he said. Each pixel in the image is some color. How do you describe that color? Well, you describe it as a superposition. Oh, that's a physics word. So AEP guy. No. Girl. You girl. <laughs> oh, sorry. I'm sorry. I, you are. You're no. Okay. Anyway. AP person. <laughs> <laughs> Physics people love the word superposition. Okay. But mathematicians like linear combination. That's what we like to say. So, so anyway, a pixel is a certain color. That color is a superposition of three primary colors. And depending on what culture you come from, the primary colors can be red, yellow, and blue, or or red, green, and what? Red, green, and blue, yeah, I, RGB, you know. We, we've all, there's all kinds of ways of describing the primary colors. But anyway, each pixel, so a color image, and my apologies to any British or Canadian people for not putting you in color. Anybody from the UK or Canada? No? So we can say Z instead of Z. <laughs> okay, color image. So each pixel, of how many pixels are in the image, is encoded by three bet strays. One for each primary color. And each bit string denotes a level of that primary color. Like like if you have an image where a pixel, the pixel an image has a lot of red, it's a really reddish thing, then the bit string for red in encoding that pixel will be encoding a high level of red. So one for each primary color. So the bit strings encode levels of color. So, and you can go around counting up, like you have 800 by 800 pixels, and there's 256 levels per color, you know, how many bits, blah, 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 blah. And then you can go on that. And in this case, you can encode it as, can model it as a function, x of k, l, taking <coughs> values, in the set of all triples of bit strings. Say eight bit strings. If, for example, there's 256 levels of each color. Possible. So again, we have that, we can do a, a sequence of these model two ways, at least as a function, and so on. Okay. So those are the examples.
Okay, so that, those are examples of signals. Signals, not always time functions, but usually in this class, uh, you know, all different value sets, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All right, what about systems? Where do they come from? What is a system? System is not in the title of this course, although it could be. You could call this course Intro Signals and Systems if you wanted to. No one would mistake this, that description for any other course, at least in DCE. But what is a system? A system is an entity that processes whatever that means. Mm -hmm. Input signals into output signals. And generally, we describe a system as like a box with some, you know, S in it or whatever. And here comes the input signal, and here comes the output signal. And there are generally restrictions. Given a sort of specific system, what kinds of input signals are allowed, you know? And what kind of output signals might arise? And the system can have various properties, whatever. Schematically, we generally don't write out the words input signal and output signal. We will write this. So schematically. More schematically, we might have like x of t goes in to system and out comes y of t. Now, unfortunately, this is not a really, this is typical. Typical to use x's for inputs and y's for outputs. Unfortunately, this is kind of deceptive notation. And why is it deceptive? Why does it bother me? A little bit, at least. I've given up on dividing boards, as you can see, at least for today. <coughs> Draw that picture, even though that's what everybody draws. Yeah. It looks a lot like a function. It looks a lot like a function. It is kind of a function. It's a mapping from input space to output space. You can think of it that way. But yeah. Well, I think y of t is a little misleading because it's kind of more like y of x of t. Like also the domain of that would not be like the domain of t, but it would be the range. Yeah, yeah basically, I think you're, you're, you're hitting what I'm trying to say. But let me, let me see what he's saying, too. It doesn't really describe the relationship between x and y. So all of the things like you described, the range and domain, and all the, like, I mean, they could easily be two different functions without having any relationship to the system. So I guess that's fine. OK. Well, how about this? I'm going to put your guys' answers together in my way. And it's not going to look at all like what you said. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it will. No, I think it's going to look more like what he said. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. All right. Why is it deceptive notation, in my opinion? What it looks like to me is if, if someone came up to me on Hope Plaza and drew that picture, and by the way, you'll discover over the course of the semester that a lot happens on Hope Plaza. Okay? And some things even happen like on the ILR quad, you know, whatever. But someone came up to me and, and, and drew that picture, and I never thought about this stuff before. I would think that for each t, each time t, y at that time t depends only on x at that time t. So what do I mean? It looks like, so it looks as if for each t value, y of that t value depends only on x at that same t value. Okay, so for example, um, y of 13 depends only on 
x of 13. Okay. If you tell me the value of x at time 13, I can tell you the value of y at time 13. Not true. Not true. In general, for each t value, the value of y of t is going to depend on all the values of x for all different times. Okay, so it's not so. In general, all caps. For each t value, <coughs> y of t will, in general, depend <coughs> on all values of x of tau. tau. Like, you know, we'll, we'll see this, you know, signal, say, say you have like an integrator. Right? And you want to figure out the value of y at time 7. Well, you need the values of x before that, right, to integrate them to get the value of y at time 7. You don't just need the value of x at time 7. A system where the value of y at each time depends only on the value of x at a time is called a memoryless system. And that's a really special kind of system. Some of those are important, as we'll see. So, so note a system where for each t, y of t depends only on x of t, is called a memoryless system. And we'll see a couple of examples of that in what follows. What I really like, and this, this is sort of uh, related to what you were saying a minute ago, what, what I really like to do, and this is what I would do, say, at EC3850, is this is, this is what a system is. It takes input signal x and gives you output signal y, where x is in some space of signals and y is in some other space of signals. But unfortunately, we're not doing that because the book doesn't do it, even though at one point in the book they say, you know, it would be it would really be a better notation if we had x going into y, but we don't. You know, this is where they're talking about convolution. Instead of having you know y of t equals h of t to the power of x of t, if we just have y equals h to the power of x, that would be better. And I'm like, you know, well, if it's better, then why don't you do it that way? You know, why why do you make them wait till AC thirty two fifty to do it that way using grown up notation? But anyway, th that's the schematic representation. Now, that, that picture was a signal that takes continuous time signals and gives you continuous input signals and gives you continuous time output signals. Okay. You can also have, so the, 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 the picture above, it takes continuous time input signals. continuous time output signals. And what, what's a classic example of such a system? Let me just give you a couple. How about the system that takes input signal x of t into output signal y of t equals the integral from say, minus 3 to t of x of tau to tau. That's a perfectly good signal a system, as long as your input signals are such that the integral is well defined. You know, they, they have to be, can't blow up too fast, whatever. <coughs> so there's one example, and you can see explicitly here that if you give me a t value if, and you want me to figure out the value of y of t, I need to plug in all the values of x at times between minus 3 and t. Okay. How about this one? How about x of t goes in and out comes y of t equals x of t to the quantity squared. That's a perfectly good system. 
what is special about this is that it's memoryless. This one is one of those systems where the output value of each time depends only on the value of the input at that same time. And this is not memoryless. Okay. So those are examples of systems for us. Input signals and give us output signals. Another one might be a, a system that takes a continuous time input signal and gives us a discrete time output signal. How about that? So how about continuous time input goes to discrete time output? What, what's a what's a classic? Example of a signal, or sorry, a system that takes continuous time input signals and gives a discrete time output signal. Yeah. Can we see the DC for that? AC to DC or A to D? Oh, my bad. No, not bad, just different. Yeah, essentially, well, part of an A to D converter. A real A to D converter takes continuous time, continuous value, and gives you discrete time, bit string value. And that has two parts to it. The first part is what you're talking about, I think. The second part is what's called a quantizer. We'll talk about that in a minute. But she's talking what I would call an ideal sampler, okay, a sampling system. If you're given some P sub S bigger than zero, we call this the intersample interval. You have continuous time input signal x of t goes into this thing. And what comes out is going to be discrete time signal y of n, which is this, x of n t s. You sample the input x of t every half t sub s seconds. Each sample is a number. That sequence of numbers indexed by the time index of the samples is the discrete time signal comes out. Okay, and this is what you were referring to as a C to D converter or A to D converter. But I think of this as the first piece of an A to D converter because if X of T is real value, what you do then after you get these samples is you quantize them. But we'll get to that. Okay, so this is what we would call in, in the notation for this, it's like this is like a quote unquote T sub S sampler or quote unquote T sub S C to D converter. And what the C means here is continuous, this is what the book calls, and the D means discrete. Okay, it doesn't mean continuous to digital, because digital would be the D and the A to D, and that would be the instructions. All right, that's an example. How about, say, uh, discrete time input and a continuous time output? Someone gives me a sequence of numbers. So discrete time input <coughs> to continuous time outputs. Someone gives me an X of N signal. That's a discrete time signal. It goes in. And so a given. Again, given some, say, t sub s bigger than zero, what I'm going to do is what I'll call this t sub s interpolator. And in this case, it's going to be what's called a linear interpolator. For each x of n goes in, and what comes out is going to be the signal y of t, which is the linear interpolation <coughs> between x of n plus 1 and x of n over the interval nts 
So this is when mts is less than when t is less than n plus 1. ts, y of t is going to be, um, let me get it right. is over. <laughs> <laughs> we'll finish that. <laughs> finish that example lesson. It's 12.55. See, what I wrote down in my notes here is in linear interpolator as a system. So, I've got to put the formula down.